Major funding for this program was provided by Bethel Broadcasting Incorporated, Bethel, Alaska. Additional support was provided by the Alaska Humanities Forum through the National Endowment for the Humanities, a federal agency, and by the Veterans of Foreign Wars Post 10041 Ladies Auxiliary in Bethel, Alaska. went to war against Japan on December 8, 1941. Nowhere was its vulnerability more apparent than in the territory of Alaska. In fact, Japanese patrol boats sighted in the northern Bering Sea shortly before the Pearl Harbor attack had gone unreported until March 1942. Anthony Diamond, Tony Diamond, who was the delegate to Congress in uh, 1939, claimed Alaska was America's Achilles heel, and it was almost completely undefended. Following the attack on Pearl Harbor in uh, December 1941, uh, the Army decided almost instantly to build the highway and to, to rush troops in and to, to, to fortify Alaska or to, or to build up the fortification. In the wake of the Pearl Harbor attack, Alaska's National Guard, the 297th Infantry, was mobilized into federal service, leaving Territorial Governor Ernest Greening without an organized military force under his jurisdiction. The United States Congress authorized the creation of volunteer civilian militia to assist in the defense of Alaska. The Alaska Territorial Guard, or ATG, as it was more commonly called, would be composed of able-bodied male Alaskans not subject to the draft or engaged in essential war work. Among the recruits for the ATG, Greening included Alaska's indigenous peoples, Tlingits, Aleuts, Athabascans, and particularly the Eskimos living along the territory's remote western or Arctic coasts. As the ATG's commander-in-chief, Greening saw Native Alaskans as a ready-made guerrilla force. As a New Deal reformer and civil rights advocate, Greening had another reason for wanting the active participation of Alaska's Native people in territorial defense. He became a, a strong supporter of equal rights for Natives culminating in the passage of the Alaska Equal Rights Act in 1945. That was the political side, but he was also a strong supporter of the Alaska Territorial Guard of natives becoming involved in the defense effort directly. The Alaska Command, for the most part, left the native population out of its plans for territorial defense. Some officers were uncertain of the Army's authority to provide any military training at all to civilian natives. But contact with the inhabitants of a remote island in the Bering Sea had convinced one officer of the value of Alaska natives, particularly Eskimos, for territorial defense. That officer was Marvin Marston, 
an Air Corps major in charge of morale and recreation at Fort Richardson in Anchorage, Alaska. Marston was a brash, direct man, impatient with military protocol and bureaucracy. With the threat of a Japanese attack on Alaska imminent, he sent unsolicited proposals to his superiors, urging them to permit him to organize a guerrilla force comprised of trappers, bush pilots, prospectors, and natives with the skills to survive and fight in the backcountry. In March of 1942, Marston escorted Hollywood comedian Joe E. Brown on a 30-day tour of Alaskan military bases where Brown entertained the troops. At Brown's request, Marston flew him from Nome, 170 miles across the Bering Sea, to the Eskimo village of Gamble on St. Lawrence Island. They spent several days there. The skill and resourcefulness of the islanders to thrive in such a remote and harsh place impressed Marston greatly. We landed on a frozen lake near the village. Some of the Eskimos helped me cut ice bridges, to which we anchored the plane against the strong wind. We needed several gallons of water to freeze the rope, but there's very little water in an Eskimo village at 30 below zero. To my astonishment, the villagers solved the shortage of water in a matter of minutes. They simply zippered down and soaked the ropes with urine until they froze. These fellows know everything, and I knew then and there that a successful defense of the Arctic could best be accomplished by Eskimos. Major Marvin Marston. When he returned to Fort Richardson, Marston submitted another proposal to his superiors at the Alaska Command Headquarters. It was a plan to train Eskimos as scouts along the remote Bering Sea and Arctic coastlines. He argued that the Eskimos' complete adaptation to the harsh conditions of the Arctic was an asset the Army should not ignore. These people are loyal citizens, wrote Marston. But so far as defense measures are concerned, they represent a forgotten portion of our population. On June 3rd and 4th, 1942, Japanese planes bombed the naval base at Dutch Harbor. A few days later, Japanese troops captured the islands of Attu and Kiska at the extreme edge of the Aleutian chain. For the first time since 1812, the United States territory had been occupied by a foreign power. The full attention of the Alaska Command now focused on an Aleutian offensive to drive the Japanese from Attu and Kiska. With few troops to spare for defensive operations, the security of much of mainland Alaska was left in the hands of Governor Greening's Territorial Guard. The magnitude of the task required every available man, including natives. Two army officers were assigned as military aides to the governor. Their task was to get the ATG organized, armed, and trained. Captain Carl Scheibner would work in the southeast, south central, interior, and Alaska Peninsula regions. The territory west of the 156th parallel from Bristol Bay in the south to Barrow on the Arctic coast was assigned to Major Marston. For the rest of the war, Marston devoted all his energy to building his Tundra Army. He came to be known as Muktuk because of his taste for the whale skin and fat delicacy of the same name prized by coastal Eskimos. Bucktuck Marston became a well-known figure throughout the Alaskan Arctic. We arrived at, uh, out at Nelson Island, called a meeting of the village, and explained that the President of the United States, who was Franklin Roosevelt at that time, wanted some eyes and some ears out along the Bering Sea coast that he didn't want to send uh, soldiers from Florida or Texas or Louisiana up into the Arctic where they had no knowledge of conditions, but wanted people who were familiar with the, with the uh, country, uh, who could spot the head of a seal against an ice floe at a thousand yards to act as the eyes and ears of the military. Because of the importance of the Territorial Guard, I felt it essential to go to each village in person. Up until then, I had had very little contact with Eskimos. I was aware that in some cases, they had been badly treated by whites, and I did not know what resentment might lurk behind their smiling faces. I encountered none, only the greatest willingness to serve their country. Ernest Greening, Territorial Governor. Everywhere we stopped, the natives and whites turned out in mass. This was the first time a governor had ever toured the Eskimo country. Indeed, it was the first time that these natives were regarded as bona fide citizens. 
They were honored by his call and listened attentively to his message. Invariably, every Eskimo, to a man, moved forward to sign or mark the simple enrollment blank. Major Muktuk Marston. They made all these uh, storekeepers and uh, whoever could read and help. They didn't care. They just made them captains and lieutenants <laughs> at the time. By November 1942, Greening and Marston had organized ATG units at the Bristol Bay Famine Canneries, the Platinum Mine near Good News Bay, and the Eskimo villages along the Kuskokwim and Yukon Rivers and the Bering Sea Coast. From his newly established headquarters at Nome, Marston turned his attention to the villages of the northwest and Arctic coasts. With winter setting in, the rivers were freezing, the days were short, and the flying weather unpredictable. So he chose a more reliable form of transportation, the dog team. In early December, Marston left Nome with Sam Wong, his Nupiak guide, interpreter, and dog handler, two sled loads of supplies, and 20 dogs to organize ATG units in the Seward Peninsula area. The trip would take 35 days in temperatures that often exceeded 60 below zero. Towards the end of 42, after school had started, old Muktuk Marston came along with Sammy Mogg, his dog musher, and enlisted all of us in the, in the territorial guards. That's when I first became aware of uh, them taking women, because Laura Wright had been added on. And they said I was game too. And Governor Greening says that, uh, give her a gun. And it pointed at me. And I looked at him and I thought, a gun? I, I don't think I can shoot anybody. And they said, well, he whispered, kill or be killed or something like that, he said. We would be in the school in a large room that size of a gymnasium, a large gymnasium. We would all stand up in line and take commands from the sergeant. We learned how to turn right, turn left, back, uh, attention, you know, the drills. Well, you say uh, right face, <laughs> some guys couldn't understand at all. They didn't know what right face was, and some of them are pretty old. And uh, you ought to see that mixed up. Some would turn right, some turn to the left, and the rifle beating each other. So I didn't know that to whom I have always taken up the thing, but I have always loved it in the shotgun. Hot top. <laughs> One platoon, they were marching, and that little pond instructor was stumped there for a while, and the, the men were chilled marching and into the lake. <laughs> then, then they don't even stop for it. They just keep on going. <laughs> we trained lots. Oh, those rifles were heavy. I mean, they were for me. How many hours? Maybe an hour or so. Up like this and down again. And yes. By the early summer of 1943, more than 3,000 Alaska natives, mostly Eskimos, had joined the ATG's Tundra Army. Among its ranks were boys as young as 15, elderly men in their 70s, and women. 
They were the eyes and ears of the regular army in western Alaska. Their orders were simple. Patrol the immediate coastline. Report any unusual persons, objects, aircraft, or ships to the nearest military authority. Maintain community-wide blackouts at night. In some communities, drills were held as often as twice a week. Many units had only a single rifle and a copy of an army training manual to guide them. To keep up with the demands for training and supplying his Tundra Army, Marston acquired the use of the Ada, a leaky, dilapidated 40-foot fishing boat. In June 1943, the Ada left Nome on its first supply run to the islands and villages along the northern coastline. Every available inch of space was crammed with cases of supplies, rifles, ammunition, and equipment. Along for the ride was artist Henry Barnum Poor, a member of the Army War Art Unit. Poor and four other artists had been sent to the territory by the War Department to document the war in Alaska on sketch pad and canvas. At each village on the Ada's route, Marston, with Poor's help, distributed rifles and ammunition and enlisted more eager volunteers for the Tundra Army. The Eskimo people left a lasting impression on Henry Poor. Some told me their names, he wrote later, and I took their hands and guided them to form the letters. They were hard, thick, scarred, working man's hands. And these eager faces, so unquestioning and single-hearted and good, touched me deeply. I got the gun, and then they had to practice out in the field on the snow. I hit every target but one right in the bullseye, and I shot the other bullseye twice and left that one vacant, but I hit it right in the bullseye. So that is the reason I got the 49 out of 50. And so I won the target shooting practice. I shot, nothing, nothing made a noise. And I looked over my other partner. He's, uh, his mark was there. Mine wasn't there. This sergeant had given me a dud in front of all these men. Oh, boy, if I had. If there were women, I'd have made a big noise, but I was the only one there. But after he got through laughing, he said, here, not in a nice way either, he just tossed it out and grabbed it. And fed it in there and just shot in the air. I said, that's from getting so nervous from the previous shot. And just think, two years afterwards, here I am marrying him. After 1943, when the Japanese were driven out of Attu and abandoned Kiska, the, the military situation in Alaska changed dramatically. Now it was clear that the war front had passed Alaska by and it quickly became a, relatively a military backwater. By 1944, many Territorial Guard units in southeastern, south-central, and interior Alaska had disbanded. But along the western and Arctic coasts, Muktuk Marston's Tundra Army remained active. The ATG among the Eskimos guarantees at all times their loyalty and patriotism to this government. They live along the shores of the Bering Sea and Arctic Ocean, facing two foreign countries, one now an enemy. It is important that the ATG be maintained at all times, Major Muktuk Marston. It was demanding. It was really demanding, especially for the older men like Dan Oten. He was in his 60s, late 60s. He couldn't write, he couldn't understand English, but he was protecting his own people. Early in 1945, 10 enlisted men from the 208th Infantry were assigned to the Tundra Army as drill instructors. Seven were themselves Eskimos returning home to work among family and friends. A few weeks of intensive training produced impressive results. Morale was high. Many Tundra Army Guardsmen now had more than two years of military training. As confidence in their own abilities grew, those with leadership potential were promoted to command positions once held exclusively by school teachers and missionaries. 
Well, at the age of 16, 15 getting into AG and then 16 getting a sergeant's commission, and sure, that makes any kid feel good. You know, you had to, you had to sew on your uh, emblem on the side, and then you put your stripes on, and you strut around with a rifle, sure. <laughs> But none to the pew could the weaving to walk the music, but the meowed Munayal. To no toy balloon, balloon, the book down. In a desperate attempt to retaliate against the massive American air bombardment of its own city, Japan launched a balloon attack against the North American mainland. More than 9,000 balloons, 32 feet in diameter, were released from secret bases along the Japanese coast between December 1944 and April 1945. They were armed with incendiary or high explosive bombs fitted with ingenious altimeters, timing devices to control ballast and delayed fuses. The balloons were intended to drift across the Pacific Ocean to the United States, then striking indiscriminately, terrorize American civilian population. Most were lost at sea. Of the 38 Japanese balloons to reach Alaska, fragments from eight were recovered by units of the Chandra Army. ...in Nome, Alaska, to celebrate a very great occasion, VJ Day, victory over the Japs and the end of the long war. I salute you, the Chandra Army, for what you have done. You have proved your loyalty and patriotism. You were happy to be Uncle Sam Warrior. I have been proud to be your leader. Well, in this call to arms, people did really feel like they were making a contribution and felt good about making that contribution to the war effort, either if they were working in a factory making tanks or if they were Native Alaskans defending their home village and their community. A lot of us, I mean, the men, felt more responsible and part of U.S just because we were watching out for our own interests, our own territory. If it happened again, I'd do the same thing I did. Uh, I'd just try to help my, uh, my country. So I was very proud of it, too, and I was ready to fight. <laughs> and I would, too. <laughs> Paul Agimak, Sununak, Charlie Akinga, Diomede, Victor Adams, Noachak, Kurt Bell, Hooper Bay, Corporal Fritz Beebe, Eek, Lieutenant David Brower, Barrow, Nick Charles, Bethel, Charlie Coffey, Stebbins, Truman Cleveland, Trungnar, Corporal Moses Crow, Quinhawk, Corporal Charlie A. Edwardson, Barrow. Isaac Eben, White Mountain. Tom Ismalka, Nulato. Harry Yvonne, Unilicleaf. Johnny Foster, Selowick. Kate Green, Kotzebue. Albert Eric Hagberg, Haycock. Corporal John A. Hensley, Kotzebue. Miles Ita, Barrow. Larry Joe, Igloo, Oliver James, Wainwright, Daniel Jones, Nome, Carl Coagli, Bethel, George Lake, Pitkas Point, Daniel Mann, Kugelinuk, David Martin, Kipnuk, Sergeant Charles Mandeluk, Nome, Peter Mike, Nackner, Corporal Nathan Agorak, Koyak, Tommy Neokuk, Point Lay, Wilson Akpawuk, 
Shishmaref, Nick Pete, Marshall, Wilfred Ryan, Unilicle, Louis Sagan, King Ireland.